ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the podcast. We are going to be on episode number 40. And in this episode, we're going to be talking to Billy Joe. And this fellow uh, is truly remarkable in not only his development and um, accomplishments to his perhaps, you know, gaming street cred back in the day, um, to really just a absolute decent human being. And he was a original, I mean, we're talking back in the day, an origin developer. Okay. And this is, man, man I'm telling you guys, this is truly fascinating. This guy was around, I mean, all the big wigs, saw all of the underbelly of origin and how they, and it's amazing to me, first of all, how they produce such unbelievable uh, games. But more importantly, Billy has never played Ultima Online. And I know hearing that, some people are going to be like, well, why is he, why are you even talking to him? Right? There's a lot of questions that surround this that I honestly, I didn't have a full perspective until the end of the conversation, to be quite honest. And hearing his passion, hearing his storytelling, it, it's truly, it, it is unbelievable that he never played UO. And I do, uh, Ha ask him directly, you know, does he regret not playing? You'll hear that answer uh, during, but um, this is it's a little bit of a new format. Uh, I did this on video. So for um, everyone that's listening to this, um, you know, you're not going to, there's going to be some pauses. There's going to be some, you know, maybe awkward moments where there's just, like I said, just maybe dead air, but um, I encourage you, uh, you know, listen it here, but also check out the video too. It's going to be on my YouTube I'm going to try to post it on Spotify. There's a new video uh, kind of service thing there. Um, but I, I really encourage you to check out the video uh, because some of the artifacts that I'll call them that he shows, I mean, there are some one of one, um, you know, old school stuff that he has that is unbelievable uh, that I, I'm serious. You have to check out the video because um, I think the, the UO2 um, artwork that's definitely one of one. I don't know if another one ever you know existed, and uh, that is a piece of history that is is truly unreal. I want to also I, I did a deep dive here. The project Billy was on later, where he took UO and made it. I'm going to put in air quotes 3D had a demo reel and everything. That is not the same clip that was leaked many years ago that showed UO in a 3D format, believe it or not. These are two independent efforts that were occurring, you know, back then, which very fascinating. I still need to deep dive to fully understand what in the world was going on. But I, I want to be clear, Billy's effort, completely different. I have never seen the actual raw video of what um, Billy and his company produced for, um, you know, EA back then. I don't know. I, I, th I think if I remember when I was talking to him, he said maybe one of his other partners may actually still have that video. Uh, who knows? That may have been lost. But um, it, it really struck me that what was going on internally that I, I get the 3D push, right? Because back then, World of Warcraft, you got EverQuest. You have some, some major 3D players in the market. But um, very interesting how many you know, I would say resources, man hours, they put into this, uh, I would just say concept, um, and never really saw, uh, the day of light, but there was the third dawn, uh, client. Uh, some of you may, may or may not remember that thing was a piece of crap. Um, but that was another, right. Um, separate effort to create this client. So, uh, it, it's truly puzzling. I haven't put all the pieces together, but I, I'm very happy to share, uh, Billy's, you know, story on his, really coming up in the world and dealing with some of these personalities. And you really get to see some of the not so great things about the, the gaming, maybe dev industry that I would argue, and I think I do say it, has it really changed today? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't know that because I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a game developer, but um, it sure seems like, uh, there's some parallels to be drawn, even back way back in the '90s. Um, but seriously, uh, thank you guys so much for the support. Uh, Billy was an absolute gentleman. Uh, this conversation was uh, 
honestly, I hit record and we just went. So this is pretty much raw, unscripted. We just flowed with it. And it was a, uh, a terrific, terrific chat. Um, and thank you guys for the support. I did the giveaway vanilla gorilla. He won, um, the uh, Epic prize package that I have for getting over 20,000 listens. Currently we are sitting on 22,000, uh, plays total for this podcast, which is absolutely unbelievable. Do not forget, I do stream on Twitch. I still, believe it or not, stream Ultima online, um, and I still actively play it uh, nearly every day of my life. I don't see that going away anytime soon, but check me out on Twitch. I will have my YouTube links uh, in this uh, in the notes here, and on YouTube, I will post uh, the full raw video, and we did on webcam too. I'm telling you, it's something special. I, I normally don't do that. Um, but you guys can kind of, uh, see that and give me some feedback. Do you like this format? Um, you know, is that something that you guys want to maybe see as well? It does require a little bit more, um, effort on my end to produce it, but, um, just, you know, let me know, email me, send me a message on discord. I sincerely appreciate it guys. We will catch you all next time. Like single player stuff, right? You know, that's the world that I came. That's what the world I grew up in. And when, uh, when the internet, so to speak, you know, happened, uh, I remember they came around and they were trying to talk us all into getting email addresses. Hey, you need an email address. I need an email address. What's that uh, for? I can just walk <laughs> over and talk to everybody. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm like, I mean, I didn't have any concept whatsoever of all this mud stuff that was going on in the world. So, you know, when they were starting talking about UO, I was just a, a, a dummy. You when know, did you totally first hear about UO? Uh, well, I mean, whenever they started talking about it at the building, I mean, okay. it was kind of like a uh, hidden away black project, so to speak, for a while. They hired a bunch of guys that were smart as hell and they all hid out in a room and <laughs> yeah. they just kind of were, you know, taking their mud experience and turning it into something else. And, you know, okay. I was so I, mean, I was so busy on other projects that, I mean, I barely even had a chance to go meet those guys. I mean, yeah. I went into their room one time and it was like four guys. Everything I'm going to tell you is like from what I remember. It was yeah, four absolutely. guys in a dark room with a <laughs> lamp. You know, they were quiet and they just sat there and programmed all day long. Okay. And so, what what was your job there? Like, what did you do? So people understand. Okay. So, so my job at Origin was uh, – so I got a job there starting as a game – they called us technical design assistant. Okay. What that meant was that you were doing level building and uh, organization and things like that and communicating between people that's generating content. So my okay. job was content generation through this this name that really just meant, you know, level designer, organizer, grunt that makes things happen and fun for players. So I okay. started on uh, I started on this one, actually. So this was Ultima 7 Blackgate. Wow. And so I started on this for Super Nintendo. So my job was to port or adapt Ultima 7 to a Super Nintendo uh, format. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. So I built levels and, you know, planted eggs for monsters to, to come up and wrote dialogue and all that kind of stuff. And then I moved to different projects. But I was on the I was never on an official Ultima team working for Richard. Okay. And I wound and up working. I mean, I wound up working on the Wing Commander team. Ultimately, okay. While and, we were building and this was the company you worked at was Origin, just to be clear. So yep. everyone knows. Okay. Yep. It was Origin. So I started there. My first day was the day they were purchased by Electronic Arts. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So my, if I had, I had been trying to get a job there for quite some time. And had I gotten the job before they were purchased by EA, I would have gotten some pretty decent stock options and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But, Kind of got, I kind of got hosed on that part, but I mean, I really didn't care because I got to quit my shitty job right. for, you know, for, for another job that, uh, ultimately was, uh, very time consuming and life eating. So, but, and, yeah, and, so and I, eventually, and I, I guess I'd say I started as a level designer person and I moved up to management because nobody okay. else liked to manage. Right. Yeah, so, I'm sure. Um, now the motto was we create worlds, right? Is yep. that kind of now? What is that? What did that really mean internally? Like you know, we read that, but I don't know. What does that mean? Oh, that's a great. I mean, that's a great question. Um, so, Origin was at the time 
the like premier game developer as in uh, they made enormous games that had more content than anybody else. Okay. So we spent a ton of time and a ton of money building lots and lots and lots of content. Um, so the, the, I guess you could kind of say that we did two things at the same time. So we built, um, engines to okay. make the games work. So like, for example, Ultima seven right. Black gate on super Nintendo used the same engine, which is a tile engine, very familiar to what you see. So they plop down little, you know, uh, little diamonds in the right. world where okay. the avatar and everybody walks along. So those are called tiles. And then uh, each one of those things on a Super Nintendo is called a cell. And then the cells can be built or built into chunks. And those chunks would go down. And basically, so we had to build everything piece by piece by piece yeah. by piece. So you had two different groups of people that were working. You had like your tech group and your tech team that was building the um, that was that was building the uh, uh, the engine itself. Okay. And then you had the team that was building the content, right? So you had the level creators. You know, so okay. now nowadays you have like an engine that's done, like you know, uh, Unreal or something, or yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you just download that engine and you start building content, right? Mm -hmm. And your big job is to generate the art and things that go into the engine instead of building the engine. So I we see. were building an engine and building content, and sometimes you'd come into work and the engine will have changed. <laughs> and then you got to rebuild all your content from scratch. Oh man! So it's like this constant balance between you know done enough uh, to <laughs> yeah. and start building, and then the other thing was that uh, we were building things on PCs and with weird you know hardware configurations and sound configurations and everything else. So uh, the machine that you were building on. Uh, would be hopefully the best machine that you could possibly get at that time, okay. hoping that by the time you finish the project, that that would be a machine that people would either aspire to or they would actually have. I so see. a lot of the stuff that we did was like pushing the limit of what a machine could do. Wow. So it's like you know, if there was, I mean, I, I, I can't remember all of the numbers. If it was a 286, 386, 486, Pentium, blah, 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 blah. You know, we were always buying the newest machines because we were going to overload them no matter what it right. was, no <laughs> matter what. And then uh, every time there was a new piece of hardware that would come out, like a um, like a soundboard or something like that, you'll hear about the Creative Lab Sound Blaster. Yeah, Sound so Blaster, like yeah. You would pro yeah, so you put it in your machine and it could do uh, voice, right? Mm -hmm. But your normal machine couldn't. So right. what we would do is we would finish our, we'd finish our games and then we would do add-on packs that would that would take advantage of the voice. We do a voice pack. I see. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so what was happening at the time was that these hardware manufacturers like Creative, uh, they would they would build these these cool pieces of hardware and they'd just ship us as many as we wanted. So oh, they would wow. go, Hey, there's this new cool thing, man. Will you please do something for it? And we were like, Yeah, that is cool. And if somebody really liked it. They might stay mm -hmm. over a weekend or do some extra time to try to put something cool in. And then that kind of would uh, float uh, through the building. And then they'd figure out some way to, to make a decision whether they're going to put it in or not. And I'm assuming and you were so, kind of testing that hardware out as well for that company. In oh, sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, if, you, if you look historically at this stuff like, you know, the Sound Blaster, uh, they actually thank Origin for building their company. Wow, because yeah. we would put out these games that were super high end for the machines at the time. And then we would add an add on to it that the people that could afford those badass machines to run yeah. our games, they'd go, if they'd pay for that sound blaster and they would put that thing in their machine and they'd make that work. Yeah. And so it was a, it was an entire experience. So, and, and the other thing that's interesting about this is that building these games were so resource heavy, like as in personnel, okay. that uh, you'd have all these employees that were working on this game. And then when you finish the game, you know, not everybody's going to have something to do immediately. It's like, you don't <laughs> move one giant game 
you know, to start the next game and everybody goes there. Right. So what they did was they would move those teams uh, onto creating additional content packs. And then some people would work on the, uh, the, the voice packs and things like that. Yeah. So it kept as many people busy and employed as you possibly could. And it also created more products so that uh, you'd have the first version come out and then there'd be a gold version. And then there might be a voice pack and then there'd be yeah. the, the, whole thing with with the extra content and the voice pack so you'd sell what they call multiple SKUs, right so stock sku stock keep stock keep stock keeping unit right so you'd have all these different SKUs come out and that would you know keep the market happy it would keep the sales team happy keep everybody busy you know and that was that was part of it so we were like one of the original uh downloadable content manufacturers that wow. worked in concert with hardware as well because so it's like, yeah. and, and you kind of, um, yeah, I mean, you really worked with, I would say some of the legends of the industry un unbeknownst to you maybe at the time, but, you know, taking us back there, like was origin a, a good place to work? Did you have a good time there? What was your kind of hot take? Oh, that's a great question right there. Um, so I loved working at origin. Okay. I knew, I knew what I was getting into because, uh, my, friend and current and roommate at the time, Steve Powers had uh, gotten a job there. Okay. So they kind of, it worked out so that, um, so Steve and I uh, had our own paths to get to Austin and he, uh, he applied at origin because he saw in the newspaper, they got, there was an ad <laughs> that said computer artist needed. Yeah. And so he was like, fantastic. And so we'd been playing D and D together forever. And he had, he had used his uh, artistic skills to do a whole ton of drawing. He was a fantastic DM. And so he took all of his materials up there to try to get a job as an artist at, at Origin. Yeah. Know? And so he came home and he goes, well, I said, did you get the job? What's the deal? And he goes, he goes, no, I didn't. Um, and I'm like, well, that sucks. He goes, but I did get a job as a game designer. And I was like, you got a job as a video game <laughs> designer. Right. And that's, that's a job that somebody could <laughs> And, uh, and it was at that moment that I decided that I needed to go design video games. Too for <laughs> right. I played them forever. I played D and D I knew Steve. And then I, and then I watched Steve. So Steve was working on Ultima seven, uh, black or not black, excuse me, serpent Isle. Okay. So that was the sequel, so to speak. Yeah. It's actually more of a sequel than an add on pack to Ultima seven. Yeah. So they spent so much time on that thing. It was absolutely insane. And, uh, so, Steve started working overtime. You know, they called it crunch, right? <laughs> okay. So he started. He started working. It's unpaid overtime. Right. Right? Yeah. So he started right. working. Yeah. You know, he started working crunch, and they had all these crazy deadlines of one sort or another that would come up, and they were more important than having a life. And so, um, I was like, I was like, I need this job. So I just started doing anything I could to get hired at Origin. Yeah. And so, um. So I would go up to Origin and bring him lunch or bring him dinner or hang out with him. Yeah. Uh, one of the guys in his rooms named Dave Byer, uh, one of, Dave had decided he was going to start the Origin softball team. Okay. So uh, they were able to get like, I don't, I don't know what the minimum number of players is, 11 or 12 or whatever, but they mm. were at they were one below the correct <laughs> number of players. Yeah. And I go, hey, can I be on the Origin softball team? He goes, well. You know, it's, you're not an employee, but I am the boss. And so, okay, yeah, you can be on our team. So wow. I'm the coach. I can decide. So I got to be <laughs> on the Origin softball team before I was an employee <laughs> okay. at the play. Wow. And uh, I'm out there playing, you know, softball with all the um, with all the people that work there. And then every so often, people like Warren or Richard would come out and throw the ball around with us. And that was really crazy because they were like, you're wearing a and you don't work here, or do you work here? <laughs> it was pretty it was pretty weird but anyway so during all that time i saw steve you know killing himself for his for the job and right. he's working his ass off and and so i was like you know i knew what i was getting into so sure. i knew if i got yeah. a job there i was going to be you know working myself to death and <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I was like i don't care this is better than you know uh doing the work that i had done i'd done i've had really shitty jobs oh and so yeah this was, yeah so this and, was a fantastic step up and just like fast forwarding just a, a current you know question is 
looking back, right, on all the headaches, hassles, and maybe horse shit you had to deal with at that job, was it worth it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, awesome. Yeah. That's a good take. Now, okay. I would say, I, I, taken as a whole, it was worth it. <laughs> right, there, yeah. There are plenty of times I can look back on and say, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. Like, that was stupid. I mean, I was I was taken advantage of quite a bit. Oh, well, I'm like, sure, yeah. Yeah. You know, look at, looking back on it, knowing what I know now about the <laughs> trafficking industry yeah. uh, and the, the laws, uh, there I was labor trafficked. Yeah. Oh, well, I oh, think, and I'm not alone. Yeah, I'm not alone. I, I remember, uh, and I probably we're getting the weeds in a second, but I remember I had a real shitty job, like you said, and it was a corporate job, and I ended up leaving. I found another job, whatever. I get a call like three years later from this company, right, and they said, um, "Hey, uh, you need to come into the office to pick up your check." You know, and I'm like, "Check." I'm like, "It's been years." I'm like, "I don't, you don't, I'm like, but whatever, right?" So I walk in. And I walk into HR and they have a stack of checks, right? And we already knew that they were abusing labor hours. Someone, I guess, reported this company and they had to pay out like they went, they backdated and paid out everyone like a lump sum, you know? So I'm very familiar with, you know, like that kind of thing because it's, yeah, being, you know, well, uh, I wish I would have gotten some lump sum something. That <laughs> right. You yeah. Know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I know I get it. Um and, and it is really and, and and I apologize, I laughed when you said I saw an ad in the newspaper because that is such a like lost art form that I'm like Yeah, you know, there there what are the no, odds uh, that you would even see that? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. And and just that, that, even more the fact that you're throwing a softball around with like Richard Garriott is probably the most outrageous thing, you know. Someone could hear about, right? Um, yeah, we're we're in the uh, we're in origin colors. <laughs> as if I'm in. Hold on, even I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah. It's hilarious. It's like the thing that he didn't even ask. He's <laughs> born here. I mean, you should have known. Right. <clears throat> what a uh, what an experience. Yeah, I might be like. <clears throat> I've gotten rid of a bunch of my origin stuff, but this is my old small shirt. Wow. That is insane. Wow. It is. The yeah, mad uh, batters. <laughs> yeah, the mad batters for a while, and then, uh, and then we were, then we were swing dot bat because of <laughs> bat is batch file. Batch file. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, so we thought it was funny, but everybody, everybody else that was playing in that softball league, yeah. um, we were in the beginner level down at the very bottom. <laughs> But it turned out that all of the experts were there because they filled up all the expert le level, then the mid-range level, and they they all wanted to keep playing, so they all were in there. So we uh, would lose by like blowout scores, <laughs> like 13-0. Yeah. I think we, we won maybe two games because the other teams <laughs> didn't show up. <laughs> Sounds like a bunch of programmers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were, we were, we were all a bunch of. Uh, I don't want to say out of shape nerds because everybody wasn't yeah. out of shape, but we were not tip top. Right. Yeah. As a team, we tried. Well, we had, but we had a lot of fun. Well, it's funny. People uh, look at me and they're like, you know, probably think I'm a little bit more hardcore than I am. I'm like, man, I, I'm the biggest nerd you've ever seen i may not match the mo but that's who i am yeah. at the core um love it so okay um so a lot of people said too that ea was really the undoing of origin what is your kind of opinion on that okay <clears throat> all right well origin somehow managed to succeed despite itself okay before ea came along so what was happening was uh, Origin was just making bigger and bigger games that were costing more and more money. Yep. And so they'd do a game, it'd be really successful, that money would go into the bank, and they basically reinvested it in the next game. And then the yeah. game just never came out on time. 
you know, so these things would just get pushed back and back and back. So um, now my brain is fuzzy on everything. So take all of this with it, with I remember this happening, which may not be 100%. Sure. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So when I started, when I started applying, uh, they were in the middle of making this game called Strike Commander. Okay. And Strike Commander was uh, way ahead of its time. It was it was Wing Commander, except in a jet with terrain on oh, wow. machines that were not supposed to be doing any of that stuff. <laughs> so the team was killing it. So the Strike Commander team was killing itself to get that thing finished. Yeah. And they were nowhere near done, but they kept telling the world that they were almost done. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> they basically purchased origin believing that strike commander was going to hit some completely unrealistic target. Wow. Okay. And it is my belief um, that had EA not purchased origin, that would have been the end of EA. Wow. Or end, of, end of origin. Excuse or, me. Not, yeah. Not well that, EA. that probably makes a little bit sense why that deal may have occurred because they were kind of desperate to, you know, I assume link up or sell or whatever to get more access to more resources is my assumption. I guarantee. Yeah. I, yes. Origin needed those resources. They yeah. needed them badly. Um, I don't know all of the behind the scenes. I sure. mean, it could have, yeah. it could have been, everything was fine, but it sure didn't look that way to me. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so there was a, there was a, a split, so to speak. I mean, you had like, I, I'm going to say it was like 90 people, you know, it might've sure. been smaller than that, but at the time, uh, there was about 90 or so employees at Origin, and uh, they are the ones that got the stock options okay. because that's they were there before EA, right? Yeah. And then the, after EA was purchased, you're an Electronic Arts employee, and the people that were there beforehand kind of had this, uh, this everything was perfect before EA came along. There was uh, a picture yeah. of it. Uh, a, a picture of the um, of the company, all the employees at the time, and as one yeah. of, as every one of them left the company, they put a little red X over oh, them. Oh man, yeah. So, like, every time somebody left, that picture would get updated and sent out, and it was kind of <laughs> like this. I, it wasn't us versus them, but it was a lot of us versus them. Right. So the the thinking was that EA was ruining Origin uh, when really EA had put enough money in the bank account to keep Origin alive. And mm. at the same time, the EA culture was, hey, can you please finish this thing on time with the money that we promised you or that, yeah, that you right. asked for? And that was agreed, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it just kind of went on and on, and they'd, ha they'd have to go back for more money, and EA got very frustrated, and uh, ultimately they started kind of, um, you know, tightening the purse strings, and you had right. to go. Uh, it created this culture of, uh, of lying. So we <laughs> at Origin would be working on a project and we knew this thing wasn't going to, wasn't going to make it. Right. But the only way to keep the money coming in from EA was to tell them that you were further ahead than, wow. uh, than you were. And if you mentioned that, you know, oh, everybody on the team thinks this is going to take nine months to accomplish this thing. Um, when you went into resource management meetings, so yeah. like every X number of months or whatever, you would go in and you'd have to justify your existence. And so everybody would just lie. And I'm like, <laughs> what's wrong with you guys? Yeah. One time, one of my one of my bosses uh, couldn't make it to the meeting. He asked me to go in there and they asked me some direct questions and I gave them very direct <laughs> answers. Oh, man. And I got a phone call so fast when I got out of that meeting. They're like, he goes, why did you tell them the truth? And it was like, <laughs> uh, they that's asked, all there is. Yeah. <laughs> what is, what else is there? Well, and so, it's uh, interesting that I, I think that I could draw a very similar parallel to even today MMOs. I have a feeling that has not changed. I sincerely think. I think there's, I think there's a, a lot of factors involved. I mean, it could be that uh, reality is things are just going to take longer than they take. Right. You know, and, and, re and reality could be that people are fooling themselves thinking something's going to come out. But if uh, if people are deliberately lying, mm. there there is an incredibly messed up culture. And, and I'll give you an example, right? So EA wanted us to, you know, to get our shit together. So they came and uh, they put the screws on Origin 
to fix Origin. And so what okay. the management did at Origin was they got all of us middle managers in a room and uh, brought us a um, an efficiency expert. Oh, a boy. wonderful guy came yeah. in and he started giving us all project management tips and things that we really needed to know. And he gave us some really, really great advice and made some huge differences. And ultimately, you know, he asked the question is like, why is it that why is it that, uh, you know, EA and origin management, you know, believe that things aren't going well? And I, and I was like, well, do you want, you know, my unvarnished opinion of the truth? Yeah. And he's like, well, of course I do. And I said, well, we're we're everything here is set up to lie. Mm. You know, we have to lie to the mothership about where our projects are. And by, by telling the truth, our projects get killed. And so that guy goes. And and he looks around the room and everybody's like, yep, that's pretty much how it goes. <laughs> so he said, all right. And he called the guy that he called the general manager down, uh, Mike Grajeda. And uh, love you, Mike, if you're watching this. Uh, <laughs> he, called, <clears throat> he called Mike in and uh, he said, is it true that you guys have these, you know, these uh, resource management meetings, you know, where you do product status and you talk about these things and people can't really tell the truth because they're going to get in trouble. And he got so mad and he Oof. left. And that was the last time we saw that project manager guy. Wow. Because ultimately I think what, I think what they wanted to happen was that, you know, this middle management group would just magically solve all of these, these yeah. product issues and it would make everything go faster. But I'm like, no guys, this is all set up so that we have to lie to keep getting our money so we can have our funding so we can have our games. Jeez. You know, you just don't want to tell them the truth that this thing's going to take three times longer than you think it is. Right. And um, yeah. And so, you know, when you're, when you're working on things, like I'm saying, you know, how you've got like the, the technical side and then the creative side, yeah. they're both trying to make progress at the same time on a hardware platform that's changing and the expectations of your audience is changing and all this stuff, it just takes a while. Yeah. Right. And we were, EA was building games for solid systems, right? It's like the Sega Genesis. It's not changing. Right. That system is not it's changing. It's constant. Making, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like they were, they were making bank on those games. You know, and I know they worked hard and I got to take nothing away from any of the anything that they did. But, you know, our stuff was just crazy. And then our our managers, you know, Richard and everybody else, they had completely unrealistic expectations of what they wanted. <laughs> yeah. you know? and right. We all did the best we could to to meet those expectations. And then they'd be in the meetings telling everybody all this cool shit that we were going to pull off. And you were like, well, that's impossible. How that's the hell like are we two years that? from now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. So, okay. I mean, you, you see, sorry, so out of this, you know, I would say, you know, internal, maybe fire or whatever was going on spawns somehow we were, you know we know we couldn't do stuff so we did it anyway right okay and now how does uo kind of come fill you know fill us in where does uo come into this picture and and what what do you know about the that so uo as i recall was kind of like a side project that was being funded for a while off of uh another ultima project okay like it, it, had to have been Ultima 8, but man, I'm telling you, my brain is fried. So they're just funneling like, a little uh, bit of money to kind of get it going. Yeah, I mean, literally it was a couple of guys, uh, a few people sitting in a room uh, on like, I wouldn't call I mean, maybe you call it a black project, a secret project or whatever, <laughs> but you know, yeah. I don't think EA knew too much about it right. until it got a little further along. Okay. So, and so, what yeah, was your, what was your kind of... Because obviously, and I'm not asking in the weeds, like, but what was your concept when you heard of you? Like, was it mind blowing or like? My thought was like this: What the fuck is that? That was literally. <laughs> I was like, I have no idea what that is. They were yeah. like, Yeah, it's a multiplayer Ultima, <laughs> and they said, Yeah, it's like a mud, and I'm like, I don't even know what a mud is. Yeah. So I had to I had to learn what a mud was, and then I was, man, I could I could not conceptualize that. I just I, couldn't. yeah. I mean, I, no, and even. Everything I know now, if someone explained that to me before I played, you know, online, I still would be like, what? That, I mean, that's I think crazy. I, could, I think I could explain it now. I mean, a, yeah. a mud is a, uh, it's short for multi-user dungeon. And it was used, uh, they started them back in the day where you had these mainframe computers that could, that had the very first 
ways to communicate with each other. Right. And so they would design these levels uh, by using ASCII art. And so you would uh, have a monster, let's say it was an at sign, and then your little your little O would walk over there and it would, you know, uh, when you find or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so the thing, yeah, and you'd find items and whatever, but uh, you could set parameters on that and you could build your own maps and do things like that. And then other people could come in and play in your yeah. dungeon. And it, and you could, you know, some people could be in charge of those things or whatever, but it, it basically allowed you to create content and let other people come inside and, and play with your content. And there right. really wasn't anything else like that at the time. Very and so unique, those guys yeah. were like, okay, well, we're going to take the, you know, ASCII art and turn it into something else that looks like an Ultima. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I, I didn't even know what a mud was. And so they were just wizards sitting in a room. You know? Now, I mean, I've already worked on an Ultima before. But I hadn't, I didn't conceptualize multiple right. other stuff. And, Certainly and, couldn't conceptualize massive numbers of people all doing that stuff. Now, when did you actually get involved in the UO project itself? I never fully did. Okay, I was, no. I was down the, I was down the hall working on Wing Commander Prophecy at the okay. time, working sixteen or working seven sixteens or more. You wow, know, it was crazy now you know, so i didn't have time to do a whole lot of stuff but i'd go down and look over their shoulders or or see what they were doing and i right. went through a couple of meetings and met uh met with some of the people on the team every so often i was down in customer service or creative services working on the box covers and manuals for prophecy while the other team was building um well the other creative services teams were working on books and hint books and guides and things right. like that so I got to I got to watch that side of, of the world, and so my uh, my experience was like uh, David Ladyman was putting together stuff for the Ultima uh, for the for the players guide, yeah. but the team that was working on UO didn't have the time to answer his questions. He was like, mm. "Where is the you know where's the <laughs> plus five sort of freak out?" And, yeah. and they were like, "We don't have time to tell you where that is." So what David Ladyman was doing was he actually was playing along with people that were online playing the game and he would ask them to tell wow. him where things. So yeah. he was he was outsourcing uh <laughs> he was outsourcing the work to the players. That's so crazy. I watched while I, so I was kind of sitting back and when they got to a, a playable and they got to the point where they could actually invite other players out. They were like, okay, well, we're going to make discs, but we're charging people to send the discs to them. <laughs> yeah. like, You're doing what? Right. So my mind was blown the entire time. Yeah. And I, I also had to, um, I didn't have to, but I watched when UO got to the point where they were finished enough that they were going to go ahead and put the, the discs out in the mail. Yeah. And by that time, they had just about every 2D artist in the building was making artwork for UO. Wow. I mean, it was just like, you know, uh, a wartime effort and everybody was building right. stuff. It didn't matter. And apparently so much art got put on that disc that never even got used. It was crazy. <laughs> I bet. But, now, yeah, so I went uh, all of that and just kind of surprise and horror and, you know, listening to EA say, we're turning it on at such and such date. And the team's yeah. like, we need it in months. And they're like, doesn't matter. Turning it on doesn't we're make going any live. difference. Now, we're going live. Now, you know, internally, when UO releases in 97, what was the atmosphere like, you know, in, in the building itself? Because even though if you were not, you know, directly on the project, obviously you knew like this, this was something big happening, I assume. I think everybody there that had been uh, working on their own projects, I mean, like that was such a, a crazy year. I mean, we had Wing Commander Prophecy released, um, Longbow had released, UO had released. Yeah. Um, I think there were I think there was a couple of other projects at the time, but these were such massive games and they did such a they they made such a splash out there. Each one of them was crazy and beyond anything anybody ever expected in their own right. Yeah. That it was I'm gonna say it was difficult to appreciate the the magnitude of uh of what they had accomplished right. um i wasn't i like i said i was not a an mmo player and i knew wow. that if i started yeah. something like that 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 would be the end of me so i never even dug into it 
Wow. And, you know, to my, I don't know if it was, I know, I, I think it was good for my mental health that I never played. <laughs> yeah, probably. Now, do you I'd remember my, seeing yeah. someone like play UO in the office and you were like, what? Walk me through like your first time kind of seeing that. Like, what, what were you thinking? Uh, well, I mean, like, I mean, I, I had worked on an Ultima and I'd seen all of them in production. So I, I really got the art style and all that. It's always right. really weird to see, you know, the avatar, you know, feeling like he's walking in an angle. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, seeing seeing people play multiplayer inside of a thing and then just standing there going, now how many people are playing right now? And how yeah. does this work? And when you start the game, it has to do what and look for everything and how do y'all do all that stuff? I and mean, it was just like, like I said, it was these guys were wizards. I had yeah. no idea what was going on. And then finding out that, you know, people wanted things like they wanted to make guilds and have their own special, <laughs> you know, names and colors and you know, yeah. they, they want to have unique names. I mean, these were all problems that I did not, I could not have fathomed at the time. Yeah. Now everything seems so obvious. Right. You're like, yeah. oh, of course you want to have your own team, <laughs> names, and guilds, and this and that, and an auction house, and a, and a trading place, and a this, and yeah. player housing. And I was just like, dude, <clears throat> I just, I didn't get it. So, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how else to say it. I just did not get it. Now, I didn't get it. Um, walk me through, you know, the player housing because that's a very uh, crazy Dude, thing. You got me. All I know is that <laughs> I heard about it forever. Yeah, and and then I mean, is is it is it in there? Is it is it still working? <laughs> is it doing what it's supposed to do? Yeah. Uh, all I know is they wanted people to be able to own land inside of the game, right. so it was their own place to be. And the arguments on how that should work were just legion. I mean, that, it, that was it was really it was fascinating to hear everybody's opinions about everything, and then and then know that somebody had to just bring the hammer down and, and make decisions about it. But even modern day MMOs, they skip that. There is no owning land. There's maybe an instance, you know, version of a house that only you can see, right? Like they don't even they just speed by that you know, thing, which I find interesting in itself that it must not be this easy. Oh, I have players own houses. Like that's a very radical thing. Even today. I, I could not tell you. Yeah. what is. <laughs> I mean, I, I will say this, that um, the team from my vantage point, the team listened to the players. Okay. You know, the players wanted it. The team wanted it. Um, so they did the best they could to, to get that in there. Um, it, I don't believe it was, I don't believe it was an easy thing, you know, right. by, by any stretch. I mean, like these guys were, were doing things. I mean, like the whole concept of, you know, a shard, like you're saying, and then that's yeah. become the, the lexicon of everything. It all came from the, the, they made up the lore, you know, that the, <laughs> the great crystal was broken into all these right. shards. And, you know, and now that's just the, yeah, of course you're sharding your project or whatever. It's like, these guys <laughs> made that shit up. You know, right. they were like, that's... you know, we're just going to do it that way. And so I didn't have any idea what the hell a shard was or any of that stuff. I mean, I, it was, it was, it was magic, you know, right. with those guys. Oh, yeah. I had no idea. It still is magic to me, by the way. Player housing is like the most ridiculous thing I, I've ever seen. I mean, and I would say, interestingly enough, this is my take. Throughout the years, even current day, right? Why people play the official server still? Many people will say, "I need to refresh my house, and I need to make sure it's still up because it's my—I call it pixel crack, call it whatever you want—but those are my pixels." And it, like, man, I, I don't know. Like, what a probably didn't even realize the business model of that, you know, then. But golly, there's people that have had an active subscription just because of that, for sure. I um I built uh I built a game on Facebook that was very similar to Farmville. I don't know if you've watched any of that stuff. Or I, I know about Farmville. Stuff. Yes. Right. So Farmville isometric game. You know, you click and you farm and you get you get resources that you can do stuff with or whatever. Right. So I I built one that was basically fantasy Farmville, if you will. And what I what I pushed really hard was really beautiful intricate artwork 
mm. that people would want to look at and examine and find like layers of depth and, and cool thought processes that go into it. So um, at the at the end of the day, what we were building was something for people to make. A, I mean, I'm not trying to uh, diminish this, but I'm trying to simplify the term. But it's like it was a digital dollhouse. Yeah, you had the ability to purchase or really rent because nothing you're you're not purchasing anything you're borrowing <laughs> you're just paying to, paying a right. subscription to, to maintain ownership so to speak of it but you're renting it so people would pay to buy all these pieces for their digital dollhouse and then you know the other part of it was that they wanted to show off their digital dollhouse oh, yeah. and invite their friends to come over to their their little fantasy kingdom it was called fantasy kingdoms as they okay. would come over they look at their they look at their land and their land would have a a big castle built on it um, or, you know, or whatever. And then we let them buy their, buy additional land. Right. So, yeah. so almost everything that we did was a player house. Mm, wow. And people love customizing these things. Yeah. They love layering one object, you know, above the next. So they, they would take like bricks and make them look like stairs. And they okay. put trees around them. So, you know, they, they played all these optical illusions with themselves and they're very proud of their optical illusions and they wanted to show each other, you know, the new cool thing. And as I understand, that's a lot of the, the personalization, customization and enjoyment of having player housing. So you well, can show somebody the cool uh, shit that you did. And I, and it was funny, the last person I interviewed, um, the guy I play with, and, and we're we're player killers. We're big PKs in the game because we're ruthless, right? right? That's that's kind of what we we do. Now, and and I'm gonna give you this too. As as far as I'm gonna say, housing design and player fashion. I am a caveman. I don't I don't know. Like I'm not. I don't excel in this area, right? I'm not really creative in that way. Now, the the guy I play with, um, his name's Funeral, right? Awesome man. Like, ridiculous name anyway i was like you know, it's perfect for a pk uh, yeah <laughs> we went into that but i was like man i said i've never seen someone who's a pk who can decorate a castle like i, like, I, I mean beyond my wildest dreams and then has the fashion for his paper dolls got the club like you could tell man you know when people really do something nice you're like it's just, and it's funny we un undo the layers and he's like i played a lot of sims when i was you know younger and i was like oh that makes sense. You're playing Sims. You're building different things. It's almost like Legos, like a digital Lego is yeah, how it is. It. It's, it's exactly like digital Legos. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and the, the customization that UO allows and the ingenuity of people, you know, for good or bad, right? Whatever, right? Is just outrageous what people do with it. It is. The, um, the customization and the ability to do all that stuff is absolutely insane. You know, I just realized that I'm broadcasting you and my mic is on, and I'm starting to wonder if there's an echo. No. So I need to, I need to check my stupid YouTube. Oh yeah, thing sure. Because no I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not going to freak out or anything, and I really don't care that much if there is an echo. But I, I like for it to not be if I can help it. Yeah, no worries. So I may just need to let this thing play for a second. But yeah, I mean, it's that, and that was the thing about this is, um, like you're saying about being like Lego. When I got yeah. hired, my job was to take those pieces, the Lego pieces, and turn that into enjoyable content for people. Yeah, right, and so on, just a second here. Yeah. Let's see what it's up. Okay, cool. All right, so it sounds like everything's cool. I feel better. Awesome. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was that was really the thing is we got you know I got brought on and dumped into a tile editor and they were like make cool shit. <laughs> and so yeah you know that's that that was my thing and, and i i wasn't as good at it as i would have liked to have been but i was all right um yeah but i i got i got better and i learned how to do that stuff in fact the the very after uh working there i think for about three months i started to have dreams where everything was in pixels wow i'd look around <laughs> what 
in the is going on <laughs> here. Yeah. I mean, so I, when you say that you were a caveman with that stuff, I, I hear you. I, and, I, I saw it myself and I had I had to overcome my own uh, Neanderthal. I, I heard I heard this. and I don't know if it's true. You can tell me or not if you know that the UO art style is such a pain in the ass to develop like new assets that it requires a lot of effort to like make something well, new. Well, I would say this when you, you talk about the art style, you mean the, the pixels of the art style, or you mean trying to match the art style. I, I would say this, that we were working in this thing called D paint. Okay. And yeah. It's a, pixel editor and you can imagine if you're inside of uh if you're inside of ms paint and you zoom in really close and you just see the pixels right uh that's how it was done wow. right and so one of the limitations that uh that you have in those those old school games because you're trying to use this hardware in ways that it's not supposed to do you have to you have to come up with ways to uh simplify everything mm. so i i the Super Nintendo, as an example, Super Nintendo can load like one uh, one set of 255 individual objects okay. that are considered cells or squares. Okay, right? so yeah. you get a little eight by eight square, eight pixels by eight pixels, and that square uses a palette, and that palette has 16 colors. And okay. one of those colors has to be black and one has to be transparent, I think. Mm -hmm. So the other 14 colors you get to play with. So the question is, you have to build an entire map, which is going to be <laughs> trees and sand and water and, and, uh, and, uh, and mountains and stuff out of 14 colors in eight by eight squares. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. You have to think, what colors do I really need? Because, like, <laughs> if you want to have some shading, you have a tree. You have like a certain brown as one part of the the bark, and another part's going to be a little bit different, you yeah. know, different colors. So where can you use either one of those other colors? Okay, well, a tree would have brown. Maybe the dirt has brown. Maybe the edge of the the water has some brown on it. And so then right. you have to build those those stupid little cells. And it was just a giant nightmare. So like, <laughs> yeah. so you have a palette issue, a creative issue. You have a num a, a, a limit of how many of those objects that you can have at any given time. Right. And then you have, then you have people that have to, you have to match a pre a prior existing art style, and everything's on that weird angle. So like, <laughs> right. it's like everything that could possibly be against you is against you, right? Yeah. Uh, they had this. So so D Paint was the first one where uh, it was just one one uh, image, and you saved it out, and that was one thing. And then they had D Paint Animator, which allowed you to have you know like an animated GIF, so you'd be like you know or GIF or whatever the fuck. Yeah. So you'd be like, okay, frame one frame two frame three so the avatar walking could all be done inside of deep paint animator instead of saved out as each individual uh, frame, right okay. so i mean like we're talking about some pretty primitive crap back then uh and there was also this other program that we used and i'm trying to think i can't think of its name right now but it will occur to me and uh you might build a bunch of pieces of art with different palettes and then you would run it through this program, and that program would crank that down to a certain a certain number of palette using the most uh, common colors. Uh. So, like we built all these Wing Commander shit. I worked on uh, a game that there is no copy of that I'm aware of. I'm asked this all the time, but I'll tell you, <laughs> yeah. Wing Commander Two, Wing Commander Two Super Nintendo was finished, never released, and there is not a copy of it that I am aware <laughs> of. Okay? Yeah. So I'll tell you that. So what we had done was we took all of the ships out of Wing 2, uh, the PC version, and they had more colors than we did. Right. So we had to take them and put it into this other program. And so the way a Wing Commander ship works is there's uh, so there's the 3D model of a ship, and then we would put it inside of a program and do the version here and the version here and the version here. Okay. So we would, we would take pictures from all those different um, angles and then depending on the way that you wanted the ship to look on your screen, we would play that particular 
It, I see. Yeah. So it looked like it was flying over you, but it it really wasn't. It was not yeah. a 3D ship, but it looked 3D. So anyway, so we took those things and then we had to crunch them down so they would make sense inside of a, a Super Nintendo. And so okay. there's a process for that as well. So you would take something with a lot of colors and then turn it down into into 14 colors, one black and one clear. Wow. Transfer. Yeah, because yeah. like most of the, at least the free shard that I play on now, I know when they make like, They've made like a smoking, like someone has like a pipe and like there's a smoking, you know, animation that comes up. I know the things, some of the things that they've done, I, and I know this because I've heard this throughout the decades that UO is just a pain in the ass to do some of these things that you want it to do. Cause it's like you said, it's so primitive that it's just, it's hard to do. It's not as easy in another, you know, I guess well, I game. It may be that you're not, uh, I don't mean to. Uh, it may be that what you're talking about is also the implementation of that artwork and those bitmaps or sprites yeah. or whatever you want to call them into the engine. Because, I mean, you're looking at code that was written a lot of <laughs> years ago. Yeah. And so people are basically hacking into the system mm -hmm. to say, all right, I know I probably, I don't think anybody has like the original source code. So what they're doing is they're like, let's say that you're looking in some file and it's like, okay, well, they're, the last number of a piece of art is 9,000 and you need to say, well, I got 9,001. Right. And so somewhere there's a thing that says, okay, well, this there's no more after 9,000. And you're like, well, yeah, there is. So you have to go tell that thing there's more than 9,000. <laughs> yeah. You have to number that thing. And then if it's like smoke, it's going to be a series of bitmaps that are one after the other after the other. And then they right. loop. And then you got 9,000 to 9,005. And then, you know what I'm saying? It becomes yeah. a giant pain in the ass. So I don't know how anybody is hacking this stuff or, you know, well, I, it or whatever. I, and the reason I bring it up to you that, yeah, it is definitely still actively developed, you know, on a, you know, I'm not talking about the official EA or whatever Broadstone it is now servers, but in the free shard world, yeah, it is, it, there's definitely a business model where people are still developing for it. And the crap that they have done, like with the client too, man, it's like absolute next level. Like, I mean, now in this client, like you can zoom in all the, like you with your mouse wheel, you can zoom in UO and all the way out. And like some of the thing, like it, you never thought, you know, I never thought at least I would, you know, ever see You'll some You'll have to stuff. show me some of that stuff. Yeah. I was, uh, when I talked to Gary, well, I don't know, it was a year ago, whatever, I was, I was explaining that to him, like, man, this client. Like it's high frames per second. There's no more like, you know, the guy's just kind of chugging along. It's super smooth. And this is all like people have done it for free, right? Like just in their spare time. Yeah, they just, just fan, fan, fan stuff. It's crazy. It, yeah. <laughs> like that definitely was someone's full-time gig. Like there's no way, you know, you could just do that in the weekend at one point. But um, in any case, you, you there's a picture behind you that you put on there before we started recording. I want you to kind of, yeah, maybe explain a little bit about what that is, because that is something special. Okay, so um, so I worked at Origin until about 97, and then went off to uh, to do some other things. Okay. Uh, and at the, uh, so after a while, I wound up working as a contractor. So uh, one of my friends and I, well, two of my friends actually, and I started a contract studio called Critical Mass Interactive. Okay. And we had been doing, you know, contract work for all sorts of different people. And um, the guys from UO, uh, Anthony Castoro was in charge at the time. And so the guys from UO had said, hey, we want to um, want to do something different. And I want to prove that we can do uh, two things. One is going to be to take the current UO 2D client and make it 3D okay. using the same data. So it's like, you know, if I am a, a temple, you know, uh, a pillar or I am a fire, or I am a bridge, that I want to, I want the data to stay the same, but I want what the player sees through the client. I mean, you, you get this stuff, but I'm just saying it. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. For, yeah, sure. Are. Yeah. So what they wanted it to be visualized in three dimensions. Okay. Right? And so the, the challenge was, can we read the data that's off the server, and can yeah. we take that data turn it into, and turn it into 3D and still have the same the same mechanics of people walking, et cetera. And then on top of that, they wanted to show what it would be like if you had a, a team that you controlled. So you controlled multiple characters at the same time. Really? So they okay. To come in and basically build that out as a as a an animation. 
is they were hmm. going to take that and put it in front of uh, EA and basically say, we can do a one-to-one swap for all of the artwork and make um, Ultima Online 3D. And so then, yeah. so I got really excited because we were like, hell yeah, if we can prove that we can do this, maybe we'll get the <laughs> job. And we'll be right. working for a long time making all this cool artwork, right? Oh, yeah. So, uh, so we built it. This was done. Most of the stuff was done by Grant Pimpler, who is uh, one of my partners at the place, and uh, and Matt Sibilia, because those those guys were the artists. And uh, this was called Ultima Online Two, and so it was the first stab at this. So I can sort of see this was this yeah. is the CD cover. Of the I'll kind of make it bigger. So oh yeah, you're good. I, yeah, that's clear. Yeah. So, wow. You know, cool, cool logo. Yeah, you know, real happy about that. And this is uh, this is a picture of you know outside in the snow. You can see the um, you see the mountains in the background. Oh, right. So I can make this square. Then there's a multi character like it says at the bottom. It says multi character control. And so those were uh, obviously so, that was your own little team that you could move around. I got to kind of ask you. Um, oh, right. and sorry, sorry to cut you off because. No, it's, it, it's very i'm trying to I, I don't understand i well i do but i don't with uo terminology multi-character control because i'm trying to i'm trying to understand what they were thinking or what they're going when after okay so when you're playing right now you play as your own avatar correct right yes. one character that's, that's right you. but if you wanted to go on a on a i know you're pete you're all about pk but if you yeah. wanted to go to <laughs> a, large, a large monster yeah uh it, it helps to have a crew of people, right? Yes. And so one of the things that's a that's kind of sucks for people that are noobs or don't you know don't have groups or aren't in guilds or whatever is they can't go on those larger raids, right? Right. So yeah. So the idea was, as I remember, uh, yeah. the idea was that you would actually be able to bring a bring a group with you and you could control them. So you could tell, I want this character to do this. I want this character to do this. Wow. And I, okay. I mean. How they wanted to pull that off, I cannot recall, but they had a plan. Yeah. And it's always possible that they could have done, you know, one or the other. And I think hmm. I think a 3D uh, client replace would have been uh, visually kick-ass, but it could have ruined the game. You know? I mean, yeah, like, I'm, I'm still trying to understand where, direction-wise, how would that have gone if you could control? Because... And I was well, going to, you know, I'm going to speak. Basically, what, uh, it's it's basically what World of Warcraft, you know, wound up being. Right. You know, the 3D world where you spin the camera around and you can do things and go in any direction and all that kind of jazz. But in UO, you would have been stuck to those, you know, the directions that the the avatar can walk in right now. Yeah. So it's like I'm seeing it just ruin everything. Or it could have been amazing. Maybe they could have changed it so you, you know, so that you had more freedom and control. I, I right. really, I now, don't know what uh, you know. Since you obviously worked and obviously did this, right? So yeah. another aspect of it that was different was uh, so UO is all flat. There right. is no walking underneath something else. So we had to try to we had to show that you could actually have a three D world uh, with that. To, you know with that bridge on top of it for example right. so the player couldn't go down there but it would visually look like it was a real wow you know, real thing. so yeah it was it was really i mean it was an interesting you know concept to be and, able to do that you know obviously you got to see you know playthroughs or the demo what did you think like when you saw the uh, demo the place like you know when oh, you, that yeah Oh, I, I mean, I had watched this go through the whole thing. I mean, I I was like, I think a new client would be really cool looking, but I could not. Again, you know, these are this is UO right. that I could not get my freaking head around at the beginning. I just could not do it. And here are these guys talking about a multi-control thing, 3D client. The challenge was what happens to all the players that have built everything with their pixel art and put it just the way they want to. How is that going to change things? Right. Uh, so, I mean, that that wasn't my concern. My concern was, can we make something that an EA executive will look at and see the vision of what it was that the guys on UO wanted to have happen? And so I, my job was to try to make sure it was realized for them. 
Right. And I, I didn't was, even worry about how they were going to do it or any of that stuff. That wasn't my problem. Right. And, and it's interesting because, and I'm just speaking, you know, out loud here that it's almost like they knew, like, you know, because back then EverQuest 1 was coming out, World of Warcraft's about to hit. That 3D thing is becoming a, like, staple. They knew that was coming. And I wonder if they almost wanted to pitch, hey, can we do 3D? Is that even possible for UO? So, yeah, hmm. ultimately. Ultimately, that was part of the equation, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, right. the, person, the person to ask about that really would be Anthony Costoro. It was his okay. his thing. He was the one that hired us. Um, so, you know, he, he could tell you what the mindset was on, on for that project. And how and long? Why, why they didn't make it. How yeah. long did that take you, like, to work on for UO2? Uh, okay, so we were a completely separate studio. Right. We did not have to uh, go into the building with the guys on UO. We would go, we would talk to them about what they wanted and then we would go off and do it. I can't recall how long that took, but it wasn't more than a, more than a couple of months. I don't think. Wow. Really? Okay. Because yeah. and gosh, I have to go back through history as well. Cause I, I don't remember, but there was a, and we're going to call it a bastardized client called the third dawn. That was, Man, it's tough to say 3D because it like was, but it wasn't. And it, I think it was too ahead of its time because it ran like it didn't run very well. <laughs> People's computers back then. And it was funny. Most people said, no, I want the 2D. I want the 2D, which was just fascinating because I bet in the boardrooms or whatever, the management meetings, it was 3D, 3D, 3D when I think the core consumer was still stuck in that 2D land. I don't know. Honestly, I, I don't know how much of it was. I mean, because so there's like this. Uh, there, I'm sure in every everything there is what the team wants, you know, and they're trying to push for what they <laughs> want. Up. Yeah. Then there's a certain level of management. That's kind of where the storm happens. And then there's right. the top where they're pushing their shit down. Right. <laughs> yeah. We want this and sales and marketing tend to be up on this side too. Um, and then there's the team that's like, you know, no, we want player housing, for example, right. you know, and it's, like, uh, there's always that, that thing in the middle. So where the, the desire for 3d was, I don't know if it came from up here in the middle, maybe some of the team wanted to do it. I don't have any idea. I mean, yeah. that's a, that's a Anthony question, honestly. Yeah, no. And I appreciate your just even sharing, you know, that because now is there any other copies of that? what you have on hand uh as far as this piece of paper no wow uh, as far as the video itself maybe grant has a copy of it maybe yeah. does you know uh matt Sibilia, my partner um he may have one but so i mean i can ask yeah I mean, I, no it's just wild I that to like keep track of everything but i i i i have managed to not be able to save everything no, I know. And it's just crazy how certain things you actually do save become like that thing that like, oh, I'm so glad <laughs> that was saved. Um, you, know, like, you know, I have like some weird trinkets that I haven't gotten rid of. This was uh, this is a, a very early copy of the first disc of Wing Commander Prophecy wow. on a special origin disc that we yeah. make back in the day. So I mean, I have like I have some weird things like that, but I've turned most everything over to archivists. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no. And it's, it's much appreciated. You have anything with, uh, with UO, um, because it's just, it, it's this experience that we just, I can't get enough out of and talking to people, how many people it affected, how many, how far ahead of its time it was. And I will say this, I still think it's ahead of its time, even in 2022, because the things that I experienced in this game, I have never experienced, you know, in any other game, period. Well, you know, it's it's funny because you're sitting in front of a, uh, a backdrop, obviously, but uh, that painting yeah, uh, by the Hildebrandt brothers was insane. I mean, like, I, I don't know if you've, if you have any concept of this, but that thing no. is huge. It no, is walk huge. me through it. I mean, it is not like a little tiny thing. I mean, it is an enormous, I don't know how big it is, not nine by nine, six by six. I wow. mean, it's huge. And the detail, man, you can get in there and there is little stuff everywhere, little stories and every little tiny portion of that thing. 
and that really is the the essence of an ultima yeah you know like there's you can see there's a storm back there and there's you know uh oh, yeah. animals that are flying that are screwing around with each other there's all sorts of little things you want to play around and you're like oh man look there's lightning back there and then beyond <laughs> that, there's light there's a yeah. lighthouse there's water and some of the water is flowing and there's boats and you know you're just like the i know it's it's very funny for me like i never i was into like dnd at all i never played the original ultima games not just yeah, I just never did. Like I never, you know, as a kid, just never happened. And I don't know what it was about UO, but I came into it and I just remember logging in and I remember the concept in my head was like, you can do whatever you want. And I was like, what? Like that yeah. in, a, in a game design thing, that was the weirdest thing I've ever said. Like, what do you mean you can do whatever you want? Like, <laughs> I need somebody to tell me exactly what I'm supposed <laughs> yeah. to do. It's like, Right, oh, man. <laughs> Reform, you know, whatever. And that was the that was the crazy thing about UO. I think when it when it first came out, I was like, "What? Well, what do you do?" Yeah. And they're like, "You do whatever you want." Yeah. Right. And I was like, "Okay." Beyond my capacity to understand at the time. Right. You know. Oh I, yeah. I just really was. I mean, I I I I want to write myself a little bit of slack because there were so many years that I had been working there already that I didn't have any time to do anything else. The only like multiplayer thing that I really got into was, was doom. Wow. You know? Okay. The yeah. Mods, the doom mods. I mean, oh. those things just killed. Me. But yeah. When it came to trying to conceptualize a massively multiplayer game where, you know, new stuff got downloaded every time you logged in, it took forever for your clients. <laughs> and servers, yeah. You know, the, you know, making sure, you know, whatever, all that stuff it was beyond me. It's beyond. Oh man, I know. I gosh, I you know, his origin really I think is just a special beast that spawned so many things that you know, hearing yeah, it, even just hearing your like the underbelly of it, it blows my mind how it just was so successful with the games, I'll just say, right? Like the games that spawned. It's because it's it's because the people that work there were too young to know that what we were doing was not possible. So uh, they just bashed their head against things and had, you know, these ideas that um, that they wound up and actually brought to fruition. I mean, like yeah. we had some guys that were um, that were really antisocial. OK, <laughs> they, they just they could not cope with people. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Nothing at all. But they would be little wizards in their room, and you just didn't talk to them. And they would come out, and they'd be like, look what I made. And you would just be like, what is this? <laughs> I mean, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to conceptualize right now, in my opinion. Yeah. But just making a computer make noise the way you want it to, we had to write you know, our own sound driver. Yeah, so it's like, you know, crazy. you get a new a new type of thing and you'd be like, like, yeah, it doesn't come with, you know, direct X and making sound on its own. It's like you didn't connect to something. You every time there was a new machine, you had to write a new sound driver. If you wanted Jeez. to do graphics, you had to make your own graphics driver or, or graphics everything. Right. There's all this bullshit you had to do just to make the damn game work. <laughs> and in some, in some cases, I mean, because and not just us programming or i didn't program but them programming it yeah. was already so damn complicated and then we had to make it work on our systems like there was this high mem and low mem and this and that and doing all these settings like a large portion of of our days was made or was was put into making it work on our machines and then making it work on other machines we had a qa department and their entire they had, they had people that their entire job was Build a machine, test it on that machine. Now trade wow. that out for something else. They literally were rebuilding machines nonstop and Jeez. testing every version on all these different machines. I mean, these guys were like unsung heroes. Right. And so, oh, yeah. they, you know, and we didn't have like 8,000 machines. I mean, they literally <laughs> yeah. had to take these things and try out all sorts of different crap. Now, and, and then when you were a player, you'd buy this thing and we would have to. Uh, we would have to have planned. So when somebody called, they'd be like, oh, I've got such and such and such and such and such. <laughs> and such. And so customer service had to have a book that said, okay, well, 
Okay, that appears to be this thing. Now you need to do A, B, and C. We charged people money to call us and tell them how to make their <laughs> stuff work. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I tell you what, if, if you wasn't working for me, yeah, I'd be in a rough place. So I get it. Now, um, leading to my, you know, we're getting to the wrap up phase here. Do you okay. regret like not ever really playing UO in hindsight? No. No. You don't. Interesting. Okay. No, man. I, and I'll tell you, I, I'm, I, when I do something, I do it. Okay. I, mean, I really, my, I, I, what is it? I, I like to say if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Yeah. But I mean, I, I try to go to the end. And so when I get into games, I, I really dig into them hard. I have always had a feeling that if I would have started playing you, <laughs> I would have, uh, I probably would still be playing it, but I also would have gone down the path of starting probably to wind up working on other MMO games, right. which those things would have gotten me addicted as well. I mean, like, uh, you know, I've had friends that have gone off and worked on really, really big MMOs, and I'm pretty sure I would have followed them to the other companies and I'd still be doing that stuff. And, you know, there's, there's a special, um, something you have to come to grips with is when you are building something that is as loved as Ultima Online. It is a massively multiplayer thing. These games are running 24 hours a day. Yep. And when something breaks, your ass is getting up at 4.30 in the morning and people are <laughs> yeah. fixing it. Yeah. I mean, like those guys were wearing pagers. And when something went wrong, I mean, it was like emergency time, you know, because everything, the whole company was essentially riding on that thing. Right, you know, yeah. It was like everybody was like, "Holy shit, dude! If we if we fuck this up, That's you know, it. it's gonna yeah. ruin everybody, right?" I mean, like there was an entire industry of people that were yeah. hoping that it would succeed and watching it succeed, and you know, I'm I hope there wasn't anybody that was hoping for it to fail, but I mean, the the team was like on twenty four hour call, and I'm right. like. You know that's a lot of damn pressure, and I would have been stuck right in the middle of that. And oh yeah. Honestly, you know, on the weekends, those are the that that's when you want to go home, and that's when everybody wants to play. And so right. it's like you know, you're fighting, having twenty four seven. Yeah, it doesn't matter. 24, yeah, and you know there was there's all kinds of other things like you know you know when people woke up in the day, you could watch you know the world wake up and go to sleep. I mean, there's so <laughs> much, so much yeah. going on. So. No, I have to say I I don't regret it, you know, because I know I would I would have never stopped. I've yeah. watched people play. I've I've watched the the culture grow. I I learned a lot um, from watching that that I utilized in in projects and in, in, you know afterwards. Right. Uh, but no, I mean I suppose I suppose somewhere in there, you know, I I should have and I probably should feel like I should have done that, but I was so busy with my own shit. Yeah, and, you know, no time, doing man. other things that, uh, and then after you know, after I left Origin, I had kids, and right, geez, yeah. dude, I mean, come on, you know, having kids and being <laughs> addicted to an MMO <laughs> and having a job that requires me to work too many hours, yeah, it's tough. Um, much. okay, I want to touch on something I'm very passionate about, um, and I know that you're involved in this space, so I got into uh, virtual reality, um, I would yeah. say. Back when it came out for the PlayStation 4, the PSVR, place, that was, gosh, I feel like that was four or five years ago. I don't remember when it released. It really was. It was a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. And I remember, like, we got it, like, for the family. And I remember hooking up all the wires. I'm like, man, this is a real pain in the ass. Like, a lot of up. wires. And then, like, we finally got the headset on. I'm like, okay, it's it's pretty cool. Like, we played, like, Fruit Ninja, just basic stuff. I'm like, okay. Yeah. I actually really like it. I, I feel like this is there's something here. But over time, man, it collected dust. It was too, like, hey, do you want to spend 20 minutes, honey, to go set up the V? I'm like, man, this this sucks. Like, it just, it's not going to work. So yeah. fast forward, um, the Quest 2 comes out, like, probably. The baby right here. There you go. And that, that comes out, you know, I don't know when it came out. I wasn't there when it initially came out, but I heard about it. I'm like, all right, let, let's, and I picked it up. I think it was either during COVID or pre-COVID. I don't know. Right before kind of COVID times came. Quest, one was, Quest one was pre, uh, it was like 2018 when yes. I got my hand put on it. And, and I Quest missed two. that. Yeah. So I never did it's Quest one. And I, and I, I picked up the Quest two and I'm pretty sure it was COVID time because everyone's bored. We have nothing to do. I'm like, let's pick it up. 
I remember, man, sitting there, like no wires, two controllers. And I'm like, holy crap. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. This, like, there's something here. And I started playing different games and experiences. And I'm like, this is the future. 100,000%. Like, this is it. I'm like, I know people may not see it. And, and my wife, the same thing. She put it on and she's like, holy, started playing it. My kids, same thing. Now, and this is, this is wild. You may, you know, appreciate this. I don't know. But my son, you know, will now call his friend. His friend's on the, I think the PlayStation still VR, but they can cross play now. Hey man, I'm going to rec room. You want to meet up? Yeah. And they, he gets a headset on and they, and they, and I'm like, wow. Like, you know, that, Man, like companies that aren't seeing this, they're going to miss it because like this is the future. And now what do you kind of have to say about that? You agree with that? or? Well, I here's OK. So there's I have a lot of things to say about that. Um, one, of, one of the things to, to keep in mind is that developers need to get paid. Yeah. Okay, so that's so right there is the thing to, to really get your head around. And so what they're looking for is hardware with an installed base right so the question is how many of those devices are out there and how many copies of your thing is going to sell on those headsets right so if yeah. you if the headsets are brand new and a hundred thousand people buy them at christmas and there's two games well you're going to get you have the opportunity to sell half the games that are out there, <laughs> right, even yeah. more, right so yeah. you can you can corner the market the longer a game system is out, the more games there are. Um, hopefully, the more people are buying it. And then there's this other thing. It's like, you know, how many people are actually using it? Right. Right. So like, you could have a million headsets out there, but if nobody's using it, if there's nobody buying anything, you know, uh, that's no one's developing for it. Yeah. Right. Right. And so so that's really the, the calculus that a, a company makes is they're like, well, if I release something, am I going to make my money back? Am I am I going to be horrendously successful? Right. So that I think is the is the question about whether or not somebody's going to be developing for the quest or anything. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Sure. So I I believe in VR. Yeah. I really do. And and I'll I'll give you a uh, I'll give you an example. So my company, my my nonprofit, I started um, because my kids were getting groomed. Uh, I learned I learned about that from the police. It's a long story, but I decided I was going to make something to yeah. educate people about this situation. Okay. Uh, and you could, if if anybody's out there actually watching this, my company's named Radical Empathy Education Foundation, which shortens to Reef. And so, if you go to reefcares.org, you can watch a video and it'll show you about you know what it is that I do. But I created this virtual reality experience where you could go in and. Uh, understand how someone could be groomed through social media and through uh, a romance situation where somebody convinces you that they love you. Yeah. But the experience is uh, you're just in a room. You can move around by uh, looking at a thing on the floor and it teleports you over yeah. to it. But the story and the fact that this girl, this little girl is talking to you, you're like right in your headphones. You never see her or anything. Right. It's just a story that you control by looking at things and learning about them. I mean, I learned all those techniques to build this at origin, but the, there's, there are features that VR brings to the table that if you use them well, you can create an incredibly compelling experience. Now yeah. I, I'm going to keep going for a little while longer. So one of the things that I learned about game design at origin and other places is to use the hardware to its fullest. So mm -hmm. like a, a soundboard, well, you know, make sure you have really cool audio, get the best voice actors that you can, you know, tell a great story, make it matter to what it is that you're doing. Right. So utilize that. Uh, an example I always give is like, so the Nintendo DS came out and it has a microphone. And so it's like, oh, cool. You know, so what do you do with that as a game designer? And so like in one of the Zeldas, there's a candle that you can blow out. So you blow yeah. into the microphone right. and it blows out the candle. And it's like, that's kick ass. So <laughs> you can't have that experience in another game system that doesn't have a microphone. So it's like, what does that system do that's really cool? Yeah. So with VR, one of the things that it does is it makes the rest of the world go away. Right. You know, you're not yeah. looking around getting distracted by something. There's not somebody over there texting or you're not thinking about, 
you know, the food that's on the, on the, um, on the stove or whatever. So you have 100% of somebody's attention. Yeah. That's so right. What do you do with that? Right. That's the question. Mm-hmm. So you've covered up your eyes, you've put their headphones on. So you want to use 3d audio, you know, you want the latency to be zero. You want to be thinking about all the things that somebody could do inside of there. So my my thing was I wanted to have a very personal connection to a, a young woman and a story um, that would that would hopefully, you know, uh, open you up to this thing. Right. So what happens is that when somebody puts their headset on and this is just our thing and it, it will apply to other things. But when they put the headset on, it's up to me to make sure that they can figure out how to use the use the device and use the app. Without right. me having to tell them, because every time I have to break in there, it destroys the illusion. So you have to create an interface that makes somebody not feel stupid. Yeah. It is, and it's not intrusive and it and it matters to, you know, the the narrative. So everything that we had to do that I that I wanted to do um, had to be, I mean, I, I could say flawless, but it has to feel right to a user. So um so yeah, I mean that's that's the the thing that I think about VR is if people can figure out how to use its features because right. I mean Quest will let you talk to it. Yeah. You have hand things underneath that thing. Uh, it can it can determine where you're looking, north, south, east, west, up, down. You can look under stuff. You know, you've got two controllers with a whole bunch yeah. of buttons on it that you can utilize. So it's like, what can it do? And that's and that's really the thing. So I think that the quest in particular. Oh, and another thing that the quest can do is we had 38 headsets in a in a room, a, a wow. college room, and okay. people could be really close to each other and not bother anybody else. Right. It was crazy. Yeah. Experience was was my experience was watching people use these headsets three feet away from each other, and everything worked flawlessly yeah. and people <laughs> in between them so what can you do with that right yeah. i mean it's got pass through you know so it's got these web cameras on it so yeah. you've got pass through you can do ar to some degree it has voice it has the sensors for your hands you could probably be able to tell if something else is moving outside of you so who is going to use that hardware in the coolest way and yeah. obviously with the install b- base being what it is, it's got to be a very inexpensive product to make. That's why Beat Saber is so crazy. You know, oh, they, yeah. they can print money on that thing because it was uh, it's easy to build. It's low cost. You know, adding music yeah. and everything is not that complicated versus an Ultima. Right. right? And, and Ultima and takes years to make. Like something that, you know, uh, we've dabbled in, in the house is, uh, we signed up for, there's a app in the quest called supernatural and it's a workout I haven't seen that. app. Bas- think of it. Uh, you're familiar with like Peloton, how they, they kind of work. It's like an interactive workout kind of deal. Right? Oh, okay. This yeah, company. My, my first kick ass, uh, workout like that was on the PlayStation two using the eye toy. There you go. That, right. Yeah. That like thing wore me out. This thing, yeah, like it's it's called Supernatural and they have – think of it, it's like Beat Saber but with like a trainer and they tell you, okay, we're doing boxing or we're going to do whatever. And like oh, do that yeah. for 10 minutes and you're drenched. You're But but to your point, you are immersed. Like That's you're right. nowhere else. And, and one thing you hit the nail on the head that people are missing is when I play on the computer, let's say I play an MMO, the minute I see a loading screen – I'm, uh, the immersion Done. is broken. In yep. VR, Done. I get the initial, the, the experience is loading, fine. But once I get in the game, like there's no more loading screen. Like I'm just, I'm in the game. Like it, it doesn't, yeah. you know, happen. So to me, and, and why I went down this whole uh, rabbit hole, but I always thought in my head, man, someone's going to create a UO. Now, maybe not now, maybe 10 years from now. I don't know a UO type game in VR that's just going to be, I mean, I know we can say metaverse, maybe like that's already kind of happening, but I'm talking medieval kind of specifically kind of setting would be just, I don't know, man, it would be unbelievable. <laughs> oh, it's, I mean, it's going to happen. And I, and I think the, the, um, the way that something like that is going to occur is if somebody just decides they're going to spend all their money and not give a shit, <laughs> yeah. uh, 
because that does happen. So yeah. every so often somebody just says, I'm just, I don't care how much money I spend. I want this thing made. I'm just going to make it myself. And that's how it is. Right. But it seems like what's more likely to happen is bigger high end games that work on different systems will have a VR component or an add on or yeah. just another way to use them. Right. And so, um, and that's, and, and that's kind of, uh, that will probably make them the money that they need because they're not spending a ton on that thing. Right. So it's like, it's almost like going back to the, the, uh, the mind, the mindset of you build a big expensive game and then you have an add on that goes along with it. Well, the add on's not going to sell that many copies. Right. Right. So our, our voice packs didn't sell one to one with the, the original. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they just, they just didn't. So you always have like, here's the the computer game market of the day, and here's your game selling in that, and of that are people that might, you know, want that little uh, that extra add-on thing. Right. Well, that's kind of the thing with with these big big games. It's like you know, well, they're gonna have have to make a zillion dollars back so that they're selling a zillion copies so they can make their money back on on the menu. Right. The, the development and the marketing marketing costs a ton of money that people don't think about oh but the yeah. marketing and then it's like oh yeah and we're going to do a vr version so <laughs> then the question there is how much money do they spend not just porting it yeah okay but adapting it to making it so that it's special for vr that's right and that's yeah. the that's the that's the thing about it and i'll go back to you know my uh my history at Origin was taking, you know, a, my first game, you know, Black Gate. This yeah. was a huge game on uh, on a PC, like as in a big, big world and an enormous story. Right. But we didn't have all of that space to do stuff with. We didn't have all <laughs> the room for the, the text and the blah, blah, blah. Um, so we had to adapt to what the that system can do. I think we did a shitty job, honestly, when I sit back and look at it. It's amazing <laughs> sure. it was. I loved it to the people yeah. that were responsible on the team, but uh, it, it came in and uh, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, the point is that um, we had to adapt. Yeah. And I believe that if you're taking a game that already exists, a, a big, let's say it was GTA, for example. So GTA right. has its client that works on PS4, whatever, all the different systems. And then they did a VR version. The question is, what did they do? to make it kick ass for VR. Right. And yeah. that's really the question, right? So VR, you have the or the, the quest that so you you can use your hands, right? Right. So it's like, would that be cool? It's like, and, and that only works when you're inside the vehicle, right? So it's <laughs> yeah. like you're outside, you gotta do this, but when you're inside, you can use your hands and turn the radio. You know what I mean? I mean, right. I don't know. But yeah. it's like it's it's the question is, what do you do? to utilize that piece of hardware and then who's going to spend that money to do it. Right. No, I, I completely agree. And, uh, I, th I thank you for going down that VR rabbit hole with me. Cause that's something I, I really enjoy. Um, but man, as, as we kind of wrap up, I just want to say thank you first of all, for taking time sure. to talk about this because I'm just telling you decades later and, and, and mark my words, you know, uh, Decades from now, I believe that these yep. talks and, and the, it's going to be revealing to people on, on you know, number one, how did these games even come about in such like crazy circumstance, right? It wasn't just a perfect, we had unlimited money and a, you know, a beautiful yeah, office no. and no, right? It never, it's, that's never the case. And, uh, and I just hope oh, dude, there were fights, man. People, I mean, EA wanted to kill it so many times. And <laughs> I think. I mean, I don't, I, I don't remember all the details, but I think there were times where Richard was like, "Oh yeah, I totally killed you. Oh, it's dead. No, nope, we're not gonna, we're not doing anything else with it." And those guys <laughs> yeah. were still sitting in that room. Nothing had changed, right? You know, so I mean, that's the, that's the, the what I recall from from oh, being yeah. back then. I'm sure, there's, I'm sure that's a manufactured reality, but that's that's what I recall hearing. No, so, yeah. And, and it's just, it blows my mind how like, you know, I still have a hard time getting away from the game and then even talking about it. I mean, hell, we've been talking for, you know, I don't know what, almost an hour and 30 minutes and it felt like 10 minutes because it's just, it's such a broad topic. It's crazy. It really is. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really interesting to, uh, to look back at the, the uh, context, right? The historical yeah. context, 
what was going on at the time. I mean, right. Like, I mean, you probably haven't heard this crap about having to write memory managers and shit like that and work in a, no. you know, in, in D paint with like little squares. <laughs> you know, just, just, I mean, we, we had an artist, his name was Michael Priest and he actually was colorblind. So he okay. worked, he would work in a palette that made sense for him. So that palette, like wow. I said, 16 colors, right? Right. So then D paint had a way to swap that palette out so you could load a new palette in. Okay. And so he would be looking at it. And to us, it was like neon green and purple and shit. And it was like, what are you doing? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, Oh, I'm doing this. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. He goes, Oh yeah, hold on. And he swapped the palette out. And you're like, that looks perfect, dude. How did you, oh, so he that? matched the, Oh, wow. Yeah, Jeez. when he worked with he worked with someone to to come up with the you know the swap of the palette, right. but he was phenomenal. So that's uh, I mean that's yeah. another another thing that that that's lost to, to time. Yeah, uh, and you know here's another one, right? So like right now you go on Netflix and movies just play. Yeah. Right? Well, someone had to write that code to do the compression and make sure that the videos would be crunched down and all that kind of yep. crap, right? Was, back then that didn't exist. So we had to write our own movie player. Oh, so wow. that, I mean, we had like wizards that would do that. <laughs> yeah. you know? And and then the, the thing was that for that movie compression, um, when you wanted to put a movie in a game and you were on those three by five, you know, discs, 3.5 inch discs, yeah. um, every disc cost, I don't know, 50 cents or 70 cents or some shit like that. So when yeah. you sold, when you sold the box, and you're like, oh, this game has 13 discs inside of it. I mean, you're looking at cost of goods, you know, of right. like 12 to 13 bucks just for the discs. I mean, because plus you got manufacturer, blah, 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 and then the paper and then the little yeah. moon, moon stones and everything else that we would put inside of the inside the box to be cool. Um, so if you had somebody working for a year and they could knock a couple of discs off. It was that well was a worth it. good investment, right? Yeah, right, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So it's like That's all crazy. this historical crap that I would have never thought of. And then um, and then, you know, when we were part of EA, then we had people that were in different parts of EA world that were working on similar things. So we would be, you know, to some degree trading code and figuring out better stuff. And then eventually the EA sports teams uh, that were that were around, they wound yeah. up sharing as much of their stuff as possible. So like a huh. lot of the games, they wound up using the almost the exact same code, and they were even 2D, even though they started looking 3D. So wow. like almost every sport is played on a 2D plane, right? right? And so yeah. why does the why does the AI have to be 3D? Why can't the AI be 2D and you just display it as 3D? So that's that's have, crazy, yeah. Right, and so you have the. <laughs> The, the 2D world with all the, you know, the the Sega Genesis, you know, uh, flat background. And then they were building things for like the next thing, the next, the Sega Saturn, the, right. the PlayStation 1. And so they had different people working on different clients. So the AI would be the same, right? It was all yeah. 2D, AI, but on, and on one system, it was like, oh, okay, well, it's all, we're going to display it all as 2D sprites. And then the next one would be like, okay, well, we've got, 3d avatars on top of 2d sprites and then you'd have a 3d world on top of with 3d characters all using a lot of the same ai and yeah. algorithms and everything Shoot. and just swapping those things out amongst all these different sports franchises so <laughs> you know and it's all because there were no standardized tools right yeah you had to and do everything on your company, own yeah every company had to make their own so i mean if you were <clears throat> you know if you were um you know, Sierra or, you know, any other game company that was out yeah. there, you, know, you didn't get our video compression. It wasn't that way. And some of the people that left Origin that had done things, uh, they wound up making products that could be reused, like Granny and Rad and, oh, okay. and you know, some video stuff, animation yeah. tools. So they went out and they sold that stuff and sound tools. So it was like they they built stuff at Origin that was never going to get reused, and they were like, "Why don't we make things that could be reused?" So <laughs> right. they did their own shit, right? Yeah. No, yeah, man. That's uh, again, man. I, I since I can't thank you enough uh, for sitting down with oh, me. Sure. This has been just. I hope you got some value out of it too, talking about some UO because. Uh, 
I love talking about this stuff. In fact, I, I pulled out a couple of little things. They're not all, they're not all ultimate, but I thought I would yeah. share them with you because I mean, yeah. how, how many people do I know that, that give it? <laughs> right. So, uh, so my, so my nonprofit and I'm going to, I'm going to do a little pitch here for you. So my nonprofit sure. radical empathy, we, um, we do live in-person uh, education with uh, our headsets, and we we basically teach people uh, the basics about human trafficking. Then we put them through our VR headset, and then they learn that this could happen to anybody through okay. the simplest simplest things that you would never notice. And then the last thing we do is we uh, get them involved or get them uh, local resources. So you know, when I go to different cities, you know, we do these events. But ultimately, right now, what I want to do is I need a van so I can drive around and do this all the time. So I want a van and I need some headsets. So to do this, to keep the nonprofit running and to hopefully get to the point where I can actually do that. I've uh, I have friends that are actually giving me things that are old artifacts. OK, that they're like, Billy, sell this, make some money, earn it from your for your nonprofit. So uh, my friend Steve gave me a few artifacts the other day. And I wanted to share a couple of them with you. Yeah. So the first one that I think is like absolutely insane. And I don't even know how many of these things exist. This is a strike commander uh, jet. Wow. So this is very similar to the player's thing, except on the on the wings. Is that plastic like, or is it metal? This is a metal die cast oh, jet. Wow. Okay. The wheels don't move or anything, but it's in... Wow. Uh, in killer condition, and so yeah. this is something that I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna sell to help with radical empathy. Um, and are you listing that on eBay, or how do people? Normally, what I do is I list it on eBay at a ridiculous price, and then uh, and then I drop the price over time until it hits like realistic, or right. maybe somebody that's really into helping me will right. you know put the money in, and they you know it's like it's quid pro quo, right? Yeah. Uh, so I used to play video games as a kid. Uh, I uh, I played Defender a lot, and so I won the Texas State Tournament. So I have a couple of little prizes and things I wanted to show you. So yeah, um, yeah. Are you familiar with Walter Day, who was in, uh, no. in King of Kong? He's a guy that collects records. Okay. Yeah, he does a card. He has a card set, and this is a this is a card that they had made of me. Wow. So I know it's crazy. So he even got it encased in plastic. That's so awesome. Have, yeah, I have some others. So this is. This is one when I donated my machines to help yeah. raise money for empathy. Uh, this is the video game tournament that I played in in the 80s that I won. Uh, wow. The state champion. This is uh, this was the Texas State card premiere where a bunch of different people from the state of Texas all got cards given to them. This is my old one of my old origin. Oh, business cards. man, that is awesome. It's got a lot of data on there. <laughs> uh, my, I think it's my pager is on there. <laughs> Every middle manager's dream, right? <laughs> Every, oh, dude, you, yeah. So here's some other crazy things. So this was the uh, this was the Seven Eleven tournament stuff. Holy uh, crap! This is the this is my state defender champion. Wow, where was that held yeah. in Texas? It was uh, it was every Seven Eleven that had machines. Oh, this is the. Oh, sorry, this is the state. So, okay. But uh, they they did it in your hometown at your own Seven Eleven, and then uh, then you would move to the uh, the next area. So wow. this was what I got from my local area. This was done in Houston. That's where I won that one. And this okay. is the Dallas. These are all the Defender players in Dallas. Wow, and these are the these are the winners. So I won the defender. Uh, Alex won on Tempest, and Tim won. Oh, sorry, Alex. Yeah, Alex was Tempest, and Tim won on Pac-Man. So what did you win? So, like actually, when you won, full size, I won a full size defender. Wow. Okay. And they they quit making defender at that time, so there there weren't any new ones. They were like, oh, we'll give you one out of the Seven Eleven, and I was like, well, how about you give me the sequel? Can you give me a Stargate? And they were like, yeah. So. I got a brand new Stargate, and a few years later, I bought a used Defender for a hundred bucks, and that's <laughs> them thirty six hundred dollars in nineteen eighty two. Wow, Whew. that's a lot of damn money. Yeah. So here's a couple of other, uh, you know, origin collectibles. So this was uh, 
way early. Yeah, I think this was during EA time. Uh, yeah, it was. So way early in them, they had these little uh, little pins. Oh, origin. Okay, I see it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not burnished, but it's a. It's it used to be super shiny. It's not so shiny anymore. Yeah. Uh, and this is an origin soundtrack. So this is a lot of. Uh, this is some of the games and these. All this stuff was wow. done in MIDI. Yeah, I man, so, the ultimate music, man, is just that. That's another thing that holds the test of time. Wow. Those, those uh, musicians that were there were freaking geniuses. I mean, yeah. absolute genius. Wow. Now that is cool. That's we really cool. And we create worlds. Right. Yeah. So you had asked about that, and that was really our challenge for ourselves was to actually make uh, worlds that people would be able to, to, you know, get into and dig into. So this is the liner notes for it. I don't know. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, that's really cool. I don't know how many copies Man. of this can do. So this, this, that's something that's going to go on out there. EA did, uh, before they were EA Sports, they were EA Sports Network. So oh, I didn't know that. Wow. EASN. These are, these were, they got sued. And so they had given some of these things out. <laughs> so they're not, they're not easy to find. Um, let's see some other shit. This is the, uh, this is the Wing Commander Prophecy soundtrack. We Ooh. hired a group called, um, <clears throat> I knew that they're, they're Cobalt 60. Okay. So they actually, so this is the, this is them. Cobalt oh, 60. that's really cool. Yeah, they did. Uh, and so this is what it looks like on the inside. Damn. Um, yeah, it's cool because it's got the you know the space behind it, and then you put the spaceship on top of it. Oh, it wow. like, dude, that's like mint condition. Man. That is brand new. Oh yeah, dude. I, I don't <laughs> use any of this stuff. I, I <laughs> this is uh, this is abuse, which was done by Dave Taylor and Jonathan at crack.com. And that they, Dave uh, had worked on Doom. Wow. So this is kind of a, it's a side scroller that is kind of a combination of. I've never heard of that one, to be, on, be honest with you. It's, it's like Predator and Alien. All the oh, okay. Yeah. It's really freaking cool as hell. And this was a, this was a multiplayer thing that you could play over the land. Wow. And so you could, all, yeah, it was. It's a really cool game. <laughs> yeah. Really, really happy that I had a chance to work on that. And uh, let's see. I wonder if there's some other So that's my Wing Prophecy uh, poster. Yeah. Signed by, signed by the whole team. And this is just a whole bunch of other crap that's in there. And a bunch of prizes. A friend of mine gave me that Defender uh, little machine right there. It's like a little a mini one. It's right. really freaking cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I I collected all this dirty junk and everything else that I've really just uh, jumped out. But let's see. So, oh yeah, here is a uh, an origin mug. Oh this man, is, now we're talking. Yeah, that's something I would like. That's nice. I am an no, avid no. mug collector. Even though my wife says you have too many, I said you can never have too many mugs. <laughs> I, know, I know what you mean. So yeah, I got a, a few other. Few other prizes like that that are that are sitting around. Um, but yeah, I am. Um, I'm really, really fortunate. I mean, like the people that the people that were there at Origin were the smartest people that I'd ever met in my entire life. They were doing yeah. things that you know I could only fantasize about. I and mean, I had played Ultima, you know, when I was younger in the '80s. I played Ultima One and Ultima Two all the way right. through. And you know, meeting meeting all those guys was just insane. You know, oh you're yeah. Like, I, know, I have to admit that I wasn't like super fanboy, but I mean, it's hard. It's hard not to meet these people that were, you know, totally influential and seminal in doing this stuff and yeah, and not being starstruck to some degree. Oh, so, yeah, it was for crazy. sure. I, I loved working there. Um, it got crazy during Prophecy. Uh, it was it was ridiculous. We were yeah. working way too many hours. Um, but I I wouldn't go back and change anything. You know, it taught good me outlook. so yeah. much, so much. Yeah, no, I think that that speaks volumes um, because through adversity, sometimes, yeah, you do learn so much about yourself and what you're capable of. And uh, I'm I'm glad to hear there was some light at the end of the tunnel for sure. Um, oh, yeah, I'll send you uh, after this. 
I have uh, so basically, I took a I have a laser engraver, right? And I took a piece of wood, and I was able to laser engrave the original Ultima Online map on this piece of wood. And man, it's like I've, no one's ever done it that I've seen because. First of all, finding uh, like a high resolution picture <laughs> of the original map is a bit uh, a bit sketchy, but I was able to do it, and uh, I'm doing a giveaway for one. And, and, and man, it's just I'll send you a picture of it. It's badass. It's really cool. That's amazing. Yeah, That's like awesome. it was. I, again, I'm just I love the game, and uh, and I sincerely, again, I thank you so much for sitting down with me oh, and sure, like man. just. I love getting a chance to tell these stories. Yeah, I am. Uh, I donate all my stuff that I, I've donated and I continue to, when I find something new, I donate it to museums, Yeah. Uh, all of my historical artifacts and uh, any copies of things that I have like discs or, you know, design documents. I've sent um, all the wing commander stuff. I sent to the wing commander CIC team because those guys are awesome. And they, they digitized everything and put it all online. Did the same yeah. thing with all my old stuff. Donated stuff to the, uh, the UT has a, um, a video game archive i've donated stuff to them and you know it's like people from back in the day uh they have this stuff it's sitting in a box in their closet and yeah. the reality is that when they die nobody's going to know what the hell that is and it's nope. going to go in the box. yeah oh for sure yeah do something with all that stuff so do no something. yeah on behalf of you know People out there, thank you if you never hear that, because yeah, that's it's yeah, respectable. Yeah, you yeah. bet. I mean, it's, why? I mean, why not? You know, yeah. why not do that stuff? For sure. Well, um, 